today. First of all, um, our missionaries that we're remembering this week are da Daniel and Jennifer Arnold, missionaries to Germany, so please keep them in your prayers. Uh, I know that uh, they're all dealing with this as we are, so please be praying for them. The big thing we're doing is, of course, we're continuing our summer fellowship groups uh, on into the fall uh, because we will not be meeting on Wednesday evenings here at the church. So please uh, keep that in mind. Whatever fellowship group you're in, just continue doing that. We'll have, uh, we will have devotional or discipleship questions on the handouts uh, as you get them, and they're available on Slack as well. And I, I, I just want you to continue going forward. Uh, I would say, too, if you don't have a group, you're not part of a group, we, we would love for you to get involved in one in your area. It's just very easy to do. And so you, just let me know, or Becky, and we can take care of that. I, uh, I don't know when things will start moving back to normal, but we do have a nursery this morning, uh, and we are, we are starting that today. And, uh, and we'll just kind of take it from there uh, week by week. I was telling somebody, it's like every Sunday is a snow day. You just try to determine what is it going to be like this week. We don't know, but it's it's fine. We're, the Lord is blessing, and we're very thankful. There is a Zoom youth group meeting today at 3.30, and then tonight in the evening service, I'm starting a new series on 2 John, and I hope you'll be a part of the service tonight. All right, open your Bibles to Psalm 25, verses 8 through 10, and meditate on those words. Open in prayer, please. Father who lives in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together to worship you. We pray that today you would allow our hearts and our minds to be centered entirely, focused wholly upon you, your glory, and your goodness. We pray that you would help us all to remember this focus and remember this concentration all throughout the week until next week when we can meet and worship you once more. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose blood our sins are covered. Amen. You'll find a handout nearby you on the chair. His robes for mine. We'll sing all four stanzas. His robes for mine.
Please be seated. Please turn over in your hymnals now to hymn number 241. Hymn number 241, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded. Hymn number 241. Our scripture reading this morning will be from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, 
and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. failed to mention during the announcement time, the flowers here in the front and in the hall are from the funeral of Ed Turner uh, on Wednesday. We had a great service in New Jersey. I posted a link to that to Slack if you wanted to watch that. It was uh, it was uh, honoring to the Lord, I think. So and we praise him for that. In John chapter 6, we find a very familiar story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And after that happens, Jesus sends his disciples away. They begin headed to Capernaum in a boat. And later Jesus walks on the water and, and scares them half to death. And when they come to the other side, the people wake up in the morning, can't find them. So go hunting for Jesus and the disciples. And finally, they discover them. And Jesus admonishes them because they're looking for him, not because they desire him, but because they, they want to see him do another miracle. They want to see him feed them again. And Jesus says to them that your fathers ate food from God, manna, in the wilderness for 40 years. And where are they? They're dead. They're all gone. He's talking about something that he calls the meat that does not perish, that never goes away. And this is something different. And he changes the discussion toward himself. And he makes a statement in John 6, 53, that really 
it, it just astounds them. They don't know what to do with it. Jesus said to them, Verily or truly, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, if you heard somebody say that, that would scare you. I, I just think that's a scary statement. But you realize that for the entire chapter, Jesus has been pushing the crowd and his disciples toward the idea of believing in him. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper in just a moment. The end of our Lord's life, and what we call the Last Supper, Jesus took the typical Jewish Passover service, and he used one of the cups, and he used the bread as a symbol for his body and his blood. He explained what he meant in John 6. And he said to his disciples, the bread is like the body uh, that I will, will break on the cross, will be broken on the cross. And the blood that is shed is like the juice in this cup. And so he says, eat the bread and drink the juice because they symbolize the body and blood of Jesus. So there is no saving grace in this cup. There is nothing here that will get you to heaven. If this does not become the body of Jesus, this does not become the blood of Jesus. And, and, it, and Jesus isn't hovering over us, superintending this service and somehow making it mystical and we're getting some grace. We are actually being obedient to the Lord in remembering his death, demonstrating our obedience to the Lord in drinking the juice and eating the bread. And I just say, if you're, if you're a part of our church family, we'd love for you to enjoy this with us. If you're a member of a church of like faith, we encourage you to join this with us. Uh, this is something between you and the Lord. Uh, it, it represents your faith in Christ. So I want you to take the top and just peel back the piece and pull out the piece of oh, the wafer. And let's have a word of prayer. Jacob, would you please pray over the bread? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the body and blood of Christ that has saved us for your great sacrifice of us. As we partake in thy body and in thy blood, of Lord, it symbolizes your sacrifice on the cross. Help us, Father, to give all the respect and honor Bring glory to you. Jesus, our Lord's precious name. Let us take it together. And you peel back the other piece of cellophane. This juice represents the blood of Jesus shed on our behalf. David Mays, would you please pray over the juice? Our great Heavenly Father, it is with wonderful thanks that we uh, come to you and give you the honor and the glory that is rightfully yours for giving us your son, uh, the Lord Jesus, who shed his blood. Instead of shedding our blood, taking our life, you took his life that we might live. And so we thank you. Uh, Lord, what a, a gruesome death he suffered physically, but uh, that's not the whole point. The point is that he died for us Spiritually, He took our sins upon himself and became sin for us. And now that our sins are paid for, we are redeemed and we give you the praise. And we thank you so much for that life-giving blood in Jesus' name. Let's drink it together. Of course, as our Lord and the disciples left that night, they sang a hymn. I think it would be appropriate for us to sing hymn number 258. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And let's stand together as we sing hymn number 258.
always be seen. All right, the sermon text this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and chapter 4. We'll begin in chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse 10, and you look over at chapter 4 and verse 1, and I'll catch up with you in just a moment. The Apostle Paul writes, You are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. Now over to chapter 4 and verse 1. Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how ye should walk and please God, so you would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave to you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification, and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. And we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write to you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that you study to be quiet, to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Let's pray. Our Father, today we recognize that living a sanctified life is a battle, a spiritual war between us and our flesh, and of course then the devil and the world. And Satan is firing his darts at us that would consume us. Our, the world seeks to pull us in its direction and draw us by its currents that go against your teaching and your truth. And of course, our flesh is ever with us, always encouraging us to do wrong and discouraging us from doing right. And yet, Lord, we pray today that your Holy Spirit, in all of his power, in all of his strength and vitality, would strengthen the inner man, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, give us the means to overcome these things, that we would live sanctified lives, that our thoughts and our feelings would all flow into our will, and that our choices that we take would be determined by your Spirit to be right, to be good, to be holy. Now, Lord, we've had a week living in the world. We haven't lived sin-free. I confess that I have not lived sin-free this week. We all know that we fall short of your glory continually. And what a grace and blessing it is to us to have the blood of Christ on our behalf, as we just observed. But now, Lord, I, my prayer is that we would learn how to live in a way that pleases you as we conclude this series this Sunday and next on this study of sanctification. May we see that we can become different people, that we can change to be God-honoring, and God-glorifying, and live lives that are pleasing to you. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, the voice of Jesus calling, who will go and work today? Fields are white and are reflating, who will bear the sheets away? Loud and long the master calling, rich rewards me all who's free. Who will answer gladly saying, Here am I, send me, send me. 
three major changes to the notes this morning, and I'll, when I get to them, I'll tell you what they are, okay? So I woke up this morning unhappy uh, with what I had and said, you know what? I'm just not pleased the way I outlined it, so I made some changes, and uh, and then I went, you know, that's going to mess up Becky's notes that she printed, but that's okay. Um, she works for me anyway, right? And what's the worst thing that could happen um, besides me not having lunch today, so... We'll see what we'll see how this goes. A few years ago, I was headed on a plane up north, uh, and it was early January. And the lady next to me uh, was from Scotland, and we got into a conversation about Scotland and why she was headed back home and what she did in the United States. And part of the discussion ended up talking about a celebration her family has every year called Burns Night. And if you don't know anything about Scotland, that probably doesn't mean anything to you, but for all Scottish people and those of us who are from Scotland or, or trace our lineage back to Scotland, it means something. It's a night that remembers the great poet Robert Burns. As a walker, I'm from a family of Scots, came from a region actually close by where Robert Burns lived and wrote his poetry. He's my favorite Scottish poet, and I'm sure he's your favorite Scottish poet because you probably don't even have a favorite Scottish poet, so I'm just giving them him to you now. But I will say that of all the poems that he wrote, and actually there are some really, really good poems. Many of them are very long. You have to spend a lot of time reading it through. And I was reading some to Becky last night, and she kept saying, I would kind of paraphrase what he was saying. And she goes, well, why didn't he say it that way? Because that's not how poets speak. You know, they write very condensed and packed in information, and then it means a lot later. Well... There's a poem that he wrote, and I mentioned it here before. In fact, the last time I used this illustration, I actually gave the poem in the Scottish brogue, and, and many of you just kind of looked at me uh, dumbfounded. So I won't do that today. But he wrote a poem about sitting in a church service. So that fits kind of what we're doing. Sitting in a church service behind a woman who, was, who had put on a bonnet, and unknowing to her, the bonnet had a bug. On it. And the poem is called To a Louse. And, and he's thinking to himself, looking at this woman in front of him, all dressed up in her Sunday best, how she was unaware that she had a bug in her hair. And that this bug is kind of crawling around in her hair and on her hat. And he can't really concentrate on the sermon because he's thinking about this bug. And he wrote about the value of seeing ourselves the same way that other people see us. And like I said, I gave this before in the Scottish Brogue, and I, I thought instead of even reading it to you how it ought to be read in English, I'm putting it into really a, a modern, I'm going to throw this all the way forward into a modern slang vernacular, okay? All right. Wouldn't it be great if someone gave us the power to see ourselves like each other sees us? Or let's say it this way. Oh, would some power the gift to give you 
to see yourself just as I see you, right? Or you can turn around and say the same thing to them. It's a great observation because it represents a timeless truth. How often we are unaware of how we appear to other people. And when it comes to the Christian life, God is changing our thoughts and our, our minds. He's changing our emotions, our affections. But ultimately, these two ideas, our minds and our affections, all flow into something God calls the heart, the will. And that's where behavior changes. What I am fundamentally is being changed. That is, the heart of me is being changed so that more and more I come to look just like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the doctrine of sanctification. And as this change takes place in us, as we begin to demonstrate to other people we are different, we begin to actually look like Jesus to them. You might remember, I began this series talking about two Pauls. A Paul who unsaved, struggling, self-righteous, arrogant, hating Christians, persecuting anyone who had a Christian testimony, and so unconscious of his own sinfulness that it was only after meditating on the Ten Commandments, particularly the final commandment, thou shalt not covet, that he came to fully realize the sinfulness of his own heart. And the second Paul, someone much later in life, someone who groaned in his walk with the Lord, came to a place where he said, I have learned to be content. I'm no longer coveting. It's part of my normal lifestyle. I have learned to be different. Paul, second Paul, was changed by God. His righteousness was in Christ. His arrogance melted in the light of the gospel and work of the Holy Spirit burning in his heart. And his hate for Christians turned to deep and abiding love. His covetousness changed to contentment. The Saul that believers came to fear became the Paul that believers revered. God changed him, changed his behavior. Now, I'd like to consider one aspect of that change. As we grow in godliness, people will come to see Christ in us. Remember the formula, mind, emotions, behavior. As God changes how we think, that's the renewed mind, he is changing our affections. He's renewing our emotions. And as our thoughts and feelings combine, he's changing our heart. That's he's creating in us his own will so that we will do what he desires. That's godly behavior. And while people may not see what we think, right? they don't see our thoughts, and they may not even see what we feel, you're pretty good at holding your feelings back. But boy, they sure see what we do. They hear what we say. Our behavior is evident. And what I'm talking about is testimony. God changes us, but he does so that others can see Christ in us. And that's important. People should be watching us become different as God is sanctifying our hearts. And that leads us to point number one, and this is my first big change, all right? So right off the bat, we have a change. Christians should be godly. That's point one. Christians should be godly. I mean, we should be Christ-like, right? Paul says in verse 10 of chapter 2, you are witnesses, God also. So he calls on not only the Thessalonians, but also God to witness how he had behaved. Holily, justly, unblameably. Three adverbs that describe his behavior, that he lived among you that believe. They saw his piety of Christian virtue. They saw his ethical righteousness, that in every situation, he always did the right thing. And they saw his blamelessness. There was never a cause for someone to censure Paul for his behavior. No one could issue a, a grievance against him. Paul. Paul says, I think this is the essence of the worthy walk, verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God, who has called you to his kingdom and glory. The way you live is 
important to God. I had a lady say to me once, I don't like going to a church where the preacher preaches, where I feel guilt or shame for my behavior. I want to go to a church where we are only worshiping God. That's what she wanted. And I, and I understand what she's saying. But I think, actually, that contradicts what Paul teaches here. Because while worship is very important, the way you live is also important. We should live like we know Jesus. I mean, in time past, we walked according to our flesh, Ephesians 2. But now, Romans 6, we should walk in newness of life. We should actually have a new way of living. Instead of living according to our flesh, it should be according to our, His Holy Spirit. Our lives should not be characterized by our sinful flesh, but by His Spirit, Romans 8 and verse 4. We should walk as children of light, Ephesians 5 and verse 8. And this new way of living is directed by God. I no longer am walking in my flesh. I'm walking in His Spirit, Galatians 5, 16 which means my faith in response to the Holy Spirit working in me is the means by which I take my decisions. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. So every choice I make, every decision I take, all of them are all colored. They are all controlled by the Holy Spirit working in me with Scripture to change me to be like Jesus Christ. God is changing my thoughts. He's changing my feelings, ultimately changing my will so that my behavior reflects Jesus Christ. Certainly not just defined by my desires, right? Ephesians 4, 17, I shouldn't walk as Gentiles walk. That's the an expression for unbelievers. And it certainly shouldn't be like those in, he describes in Philippians 3, 18, who are enemies of the cross. I should be living in a way that the Holy Spirit is working in me so that every choice, every decision is controlled by him. And let me tell you something, friends, just as he says in Galatians 5, when that's occurring, no law is even needed because when the Holy Spirit is controlling me, I am doing the very spirit of the law. I am keeping the spirit of the law. I don't need an Old Testament law I don't need a moral law. I don't need uh, any kind of ceremony or civil laws to control me when God's spirit is controlling me. Because when God is controlling me, I will do what he wants me to do. And living this way is worthy, isn't it? Do you see that in verse 12 again, that you would walk worthy? This is the worthy walk, that his spirit would work in me. This is... Uh, an understanding of what it means to be valuable, God pleasing what he wants us to be. And I think when you look at what Paul says about himself, that he was holy and that he was just and that he was blameless, you can easily cross-apply that right to our own lives. That this is how we should be. It just as Paul said, as I follow Christ, you should follow me. In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. So we should be able to say, I am following God. I am following Jesus through the power of his Holy Spirit. And I am living now a life that is holy and, and ethical and blameless before other people because he is working in me. And you can go down through all of those attributes of the flesh and you say when God's Spirit is working to you, none of those things will be true in your life. God is working in your heart, changing you to be like Jesus. Now, this brings me to my second major change, because I want to tell you letter B. This is the example that Paul set. Here's the example that Paul set. He said, you're my witness. You know, verse 11, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. Paul says, you could look at my life and see that this is true. They knew back in verse 3 of chapter 2 how he handled God's word. He says of them, our exhortation was not of deceit or of uncleanness or of guile. He handled God's word in a way that would lead them toward God, not away from him. He never encouraged them 
to moral sin, and he never manipulated them. Paul could say later, if anybody has changed because of my ministry, it wasn't because of the way I delivered my sermons. It wasn't because of the, the craft of my argument or the skill of my debate. It was because God's Holy Spirit actually did the work of changing the life. I'm going to tell you something, friends. I personally believe, believe that that's what God means when Paul writes that a person who is to be a preacher or pastor should be apt to teach. When you talk about actually the gift of being a pastor, it's not this charisma from the pulpit that so many are seeking and so many others are trying to imitate and copy to create an atmosphere or a mood. It is just oftentimes maybe even a little bit boring, but it is that the Holy Spirit of God is actually changing you. If any of you were to leave our church in the future and say, praise God, I'm different because of Pastor Walker's ministry, I would hope that what you mean by that would be what God did through him. Because if any preacher here, if any sermon delivered here, changes you on the outside without first changing you on the inside, then it's not real change and it's really not from the Lord. And Paul says, you know this. I handled God's word. You knew his, he says, you knew my character, verse 4 through 6. You knew my purpose was to please the Lord. You knew that I, I didn't flatter people. You knew I did, wasn't here to try to enrich myself you know I wasn't trying to seek personal glory, verse 6. He's saying, I wasn't doing this for me. I'm doing this because God wanted me to do it, because God actually, on the, on the road to Damascus, shined a bright light in my face and knocked me to the ground and called me to this ministry of preaching to the Gentiles. And you all know my character. You know how I handle God's word. You know my character. And they said, verse 10, you know my lifestyle your witnesses, and he says how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved among you. They knew his demeanor. Do you know they could testify to his spiritual state? They knew how he interacted with them. They had heard him preach. They had heard him encourage people. They heard how he testified of God. And I really love, he goes back in verse 7, he says how he was gentle with them, like a nurse who cherishes a child. Or in this passage in verse 11, how a good father treats his children. Paul says, you, you saw the way I handled the word of God. You know my character. You saw my lifestyle. Right? They were all witnesses to the example that Paul set of the value of living a good and worthy life before the Lord. So let me ask you something. Friends, are you pursuing the worthy walk before God? Really, truly, answer that question in your heart. Are you pursuing the worthy walk in your, in your life? Can you honestly look back at your last week, at your last month, and say, as I see my life, as I know my thoughts, my feelings, the choices I made, I can say, I'm pursuing a walk worthy to what God has called me to as one of his children. Can you honestly say that? And if it's your desire to live a holy life, then let me bring you then to point two. If you say, yes, pastor, my desire is to be like Jesus, then here's point number two, and that's my final big change. All right, you ready? Here it is. Our godliness should be evident to others. It isn't just that we change on the inside. The change ought to be evident on the outside. And I know there's a danger here of getting into cultural issues that can offend everybody in the room. I mean, if I, took, if I had enough time, I think I could successfully offend all of you, okay? <laughs> and, and maybe some of you are thinking, Pastor, it wouldn't even take you that long. You can offend me like that. I mean, just, just like that. I, I have um, 
And in my extended family, a young man who likes to post on social media all of his slights and grievances that people did against him in his in his early childhood. I mean, it, today it's it's not it's not just you, we all. I mean, everybody's had this. Okay, okay. Everybody has had someone who mistreated them. Everybody has had somebody who wasn't nice to them. If you haven't had that yet, then just give it time. You will, okay? Everybody's had that. You don't have to tell people about it. But he likes to tell people about it. He likes people to know. And usually it comes back to, well, there was this preaching and it was always focused on these issues. And he brings up the old cultural fundamental issues like women wearing pants and men having long hair and, and all these kinds of things. And I think you get onto those issues, you can offend people pretty quickly, can't you? But can we all just acknowledge for a moment, without looking at those specific issues, that God does care what we look like on the outside? He does care about our outward behavior, the outside of us? It isn't just the inside that's important to him. It's not just our thoughts and our feelings. But what, are, what comes then in, in the will and how it plays out in the life is important. And, and maybe it won't touch on those cultural issues that I brought up. But certainly it will touch on fundamental moral issues. You see, our godliness should be evident to others. And the first thing he shows us is that other believers should see godliness in us. He says in chapter 4 now, because I think between here and chapter 2, all the way to the beginning of chapter 4, we kind of have this one long parenthesis, or maybe a, even a couple of parentheses. But now he picks up this idea of the walk again in chapter 4. four furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, we beg you, we exhort you, we, we command you and encourage you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us, okay, my example that I set, and we just went through his example, how he handled the word of God, the, the, cult, the character that he had, the lifestyle that he lived, okay? As you have received of us the way he taught, now you would walk, that was your behavior would be such, so as to please God, and that even you would abound more and more, that you would even go farther than I taught you and farther than I showed you to live a God-pleasing life. And then he says, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And he gives us one of them. He gave many commands, but here's the one he focuses on. This is number one. Other believers should see our purity. Verses one through five. Paul called the Thessalonians to moral purity. Sanctification includes the use of our bodies. Verse three, this is the will of God, even your sanctification that you would abstain from fornication. We should not participate in moral sin. That literally abstain means have nothing to do with these kinds of sins. They should have no part of our lifestyle. We should be mimicking Paul's lifestyle, not the lifestyle of the unbelievers in Thessalonica, he's saying to them. And for us, we should be mimicking a godly lifestyle, living that out, not like the unbelievers who live around us here in the Triangle of North Carolina. We should be living like Christ. And he explains what that is, that it should be like verse 4, we should keep our bodies, our vessel, that's our bodies, in sanctification set apart to God and in a way that is honorable to God, that brings honor to him, that is honorable None of them could claim that they were unsure about these commands. He said, this is what I commanded you, verse 2. This is the will of God for your life, verse 3. Paul says, other people should see our purity. Now, I'm just going to tell you something, friends. This is something that is so relevant to our culture. We live in a grossly impure world. So it is paramount that as believers we set an example of moral purity to everyone around us. That if there's any part of our lives where someone could point and say, you know, that's not moral purity. 
we should run away from that. If there's any part of our lives that doesn't set a testimony that other people can see living out in us, the example of Paul in lifestyle and character and in the way we deal with God's word, that we won't be setting the same example to others, that we run from those things, that we want nothing to do with them. Other people should see our moral purity. And I think Paul extends the argument into point two. They should see our fairness. And, and this could be a reference to cheating other people in business, verse six, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner. And the word defraud is usually used in a business environment. So it's possible that Paul means here, be fair in the way you treat others. So the first point would be, be moral, uh, and then the second point would be fair, be equitable to each other, to other believers. But more likely, Paul is extending his argument about morality. And his point of fairness says that when you are immoral, particularly the sin of adultery, you are essentially cheating your brothers and sisters. Let me tell you, adultery causes great damage. Great damage. In, in our culture, and I'm going to tell you something, friends, we have lost this. We have, we have lost this battle. It's a fight. We should continue fighting it, but we have lost it. But our culture says, basically, what I do in the privacy of my house is my business and nobody else's. And that gives the idea, this doesn't hurt anyone. If I'm hurting anybody, I'm hurting myself. I mean, the way they look at moral sin, our culture, it's the same thing as whether I wear a helmet when I ride a motorcycle, right? I mean, if I bounce my head off of your car, that's my fault, right? If I'm not wearing a helmet and that's what happens and I hurt myself, that's on, that's on me. If, if I do something foolish or something uh, unwise, let's put it that way, that's, that's nicer. If I do something unwise, it hurts me. But adultery is not like that. It causes damage. And he says here, it cheats our brothers and sisters. It causes damage not just to the individual committing adultery, but to everyone involved in the situation. And he says here, notice verse 6. This is what, how God looks at it. Because he says, don't defraud your brother in any manner, because who is the avenger? The Lord is the avenger. And, and, and I think that is hearkening back to the Old Testament when, when these types of sins occurred, that people took it upon themselves to exact vengeance on those that hurt them. God says, okay, all right. That may not be happening in your culture in Thessalonica, but it's not like God's overlooking it because he is still the avenger. God will still avenge. And he's warning. He says, I warned you and I testify against this. He says, look in verse 8, that if you despise this command, you're not despising just the command of man, but you're despising God who has given us his Holy Spirit. So when he says you should, they should see our morality, they should see our fairness, I think he is drawing the same argument that they should see that we do not cheat others by adultery. Verse 7, our calling is to holiness and cleanness. And ultimately, friends, this is what it means to love people. Verse, verses 9 and 10, not only they should they see our morality and our fairness, but they should see our love. Other believers should see that we love them, that we actually care about them. We should have great love in this room for each other. Real care, real concern, spiritual concern for each other. And not just for the adults, for the children as well, as they grow up in each other's households, that we would love them. And he says, God taught you himself to love. I don't have the right to you to have brotherly love. God taught you to love one another. And he says, moreover, this should abound more and more. The love that you have to each other should be always increasing, always growing. Do you see what Paul is saying here, friends? As I grow to be like Christ on the inside, as my thoughts, become more Christ-like, as my affections become more Christ-like, my heart 
my will will become Christ-like. And the choices that I take, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm going to take this choice. All of the decisions I take will all reflect thinking like Christ, feeling like Christ. That's becoming Christ-like. And others will see it. They'll see it in you that this is who you are, that you can actually be a witness, just like Paul says, you're a witness and God is a witness. We can say to others, people can testify and God can testify that this is who I am as an individual. This is me. But you know, it's not just important in the church. It's also important outside the church. And this leads us to our last point, that unbelievers should also see godliness in us. Verse 11, that you study to be quiet, to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. There are three things that these unbelievers should notice about us. First, that we are peacemakers. This word quiet here has the idea of being at rest or being silent, but I think in this context, it's the idea of being at peace. Instead of someone who is always fomenting strife, stirring the pot, right? Getting people agitated. These are people not caught up in quarrels, but actually deciding not to do those things, to bring peace on the situation. Boy, there's, there's not a time we need this more than right now. There are people on the internet, social media, other places, saying that if you are a Christian, you must vote in a certain way in November. And that if you do not vote in that way, then you are not a Christian. And I have read multiple articles of, to this effect and read multiple comments to this effect. And while I value the highest ethic that I value is the ethic of life, and I vote that way personally, I vote toward the ethic of life. I want you to understand that no way should any of us look at another fellow believer, particularly in our church, and give the impression that we are judging them for the way they're looking at these things, and even further that we should foment strife about it. That we would go on and stir up strife. You know, when you type something on the internet, not just you and your family can see it, other people can too. And I'm sometimes ashamed and embarrassed when I know a Christian I know a person, I know they're Christians, people, they're believers, and the things they write to just stir up strife. We should be people of peace. Do you know what our responses should be online or in the public square? How can I bring peace to this situation? How can I bring Christ and the spirit, the sweet fragrance of Christ to the situation? How can I help people see Jesus? We should be known as peacemakers. That's how the world ought to see us. We're people of peace. And, and secondly, he says that you mind your own business. Now, I tell you, this, this, it scratches me right where I itch. I am a mind your own business kind of guy. I, I don't like I, my business being, my parents taught me, don't hang your dirty laundry in the public, right? Um, and, and I didn't understand what that meant until I was a little older. And, I, and you see in the South, these closed lines and people hanging up their laundry, right? You don't hang your dirty laundry out there for people to see. Hopefully it's clean, right? People like to just put out their laundry. Well, other people like to nose their way into your business. And he says here, don't be intrusive, people. Do your own business. And I think maybe Paul is talking about people who stir up strife in church affairs. It's just kind of following along that same idea. People are stirring up strife in the affairs of life. But he's saying in doing that, just don't get involved in other people's affairs. Let them deal with them. Listen, you don't need to parent anybody's child in here other than your own. I, I don't know about you, but I know this. I have enough difficulty dealing with my children that I don't need to take on the burdens of other people's children. 
And even as they grow older, that, that becomes the truth. And, and I know this. I have enough difficulty handling my finances that I don't need to handle the finances of every other member of the church. And when you get into the public sector, uh, the, uh, the unbelievers, and they start seeing how Christians are always in other people's business, always fomenting strife, it leaves a bad taste in the mouth. And then number three says, be known for personal diligence. To work with your own hands is an expression that re refers to hard work. Be a good laborer. Don't be lazy. I think um, this is one of the areas where Christians can really lose their testimony at work when they just don't do what they're supposed to do. The boss says, this is what I want you to do, and, and they find you playing solitaire on your computer or, or some other game or watching back when there was sports, you know, the NCAA basketball tournament. There's, there's some website back a long time ago. There was some app that you could get where you could be, it would allow you to watch the game, and if your boss came in, it had a boss button. It was actually what it was called. You push the boss button, and a spreadsheet would come up on your computer screen so that your boss could walk by and think you were working. And I, okay, that's kind of funny, but you know, if you're at work, you ought to be working, not, not worrying whether, uh, you know, some little college on the, in the eastern side of Oregon is, is beating some school from South Florida, and it's going to wreck your bracket. Do we all agree we ought to be working instead of worrying about those things? We ought to be diligent and not lazy because, verse 12, this kind of life is blessed by God. This is what unbelievers see, and they respect it. When you're, when you're known as a peacemaker and, and you're not intrusive into other people's affairs and you're known for being personally a diligent person, individual worker, people respect that. They may not believe your faith at all. They may reject your testimony in terms of your faith, but they'll respect you as a person. They'll see you and go, you know, that guy, it, it means something to him. It's real to him. He believes it because he lives it in his life. They will see it and they'll respect it. And I don't think they respect Christians who are the other way around. And Paul says, by the way, when you, when you are a peacemaker and you and you're not intrusive, and you do labor as you should, it'll provide for your needs. My friends, this is the Christian life. This is sanctification. God is changing what you think and changing what you feel, ultimately resulting in a change in how you live. Are you pursuing the worthy walk? Okay, You say, yes. Are other people seeing it in you? Let's pray. Father, I ask you that you would please help us as we close out this series this Sunday and next Sunday on sanctification, that we would get right down to the brass tacks, the, the, the fundamentals of our thoughts about these things, that we would be changed people, changing, be actually different and growing spiritually. Before I finish praying, now here's what I want to ask you. Is there some area of your life where you haven't changed as a Christian? Is there some area of your life where you're not different? The last three Sundays, I have directed your minds to three big ideas. That God is changing the way you think and changing the way you feel, ultimately changing the way you behave. And if there's some area you're not changing, then you can walk back through that formula. Is it because of the way I feel about things? Is it because of the way I think about things? And if, it's, and if you're thinking right and you're feeling right, but you're refusing to change, then, then it really is a will problem where you're saying, I just won't. Now, maybe God's Spirit has been speaking to you about some issues in your life just throughout the last few months. All of this pandemic stuff has just kind of drawn to the surface some things in your life that need some changing. What I want you to do right now, instead of raising a hand or anything like that, I want you to do is right now just go to the Lord and say, Lord, there are some areas of my life that you are trying to change and I've been holding out. I've been keeping back and I know I need to be different so I can bring honor to you so other people can see what you're doing in my life. Holy Spirit, please 
Help us all to be growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. The pianist will play a hymn of invitation, and you just go to the Lord as she prays. Praise him. Thank you. Be seated. Now tonight, I'm going to begin a series on 2 John. I don't think I've ever preached from 2 John before. Have any of you ever heard a sermon series from 2 John? Raise your hand. Ever heard a sermon series from 2 John? We have two people. Okay, well, there we go. So the Lord knows we need to listen to this. Uh, I think it'll be helpful for you, particularly in uh, the time that we're living in, in this world. I think this is going to be really good. So uh, talking about truth. Uh, being most important. The truth matters most important above all other things, God's truth. And we'll be looking at, at this and kind of introducing this four short messages on Second John, uh, talking about the preeminence of truth. And so I hope you'll be back this evening at 5.30. Thank you for coming and being a part of our service today. It's great to see all of you. Uh, God bless you as you go. Johnny Vaults, close us in prayer. Lord, I, uh, I thank you for the day that you've given us. I pray, Lord, that uh, we would walk worthy of you, Lord, that our lives would uh, show godliness and Christ likeness to others, and that people can see a, a difference uh, in us is in you, you know, the whole spirit of worship in this Lord. I pray that as we go about our lives this week, that we would uh, find opportunities to share Christ with others, and that it would be evident in our, our lives that you are in our lives, Lord. And I pray that you just dismiss us with your blessing.